This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. They make the swing for home in the Jennings Handicap. There's a quarter of a mile to go to the second wire. Forrest Boyce asking a little bit more from eight to fast to catch. He's got the lead by a length and a half. Larry Lewat toward the center of the track, trying to catch eight to fast to catch. But here comes eight to fast to catch in the final furlong. Oh, yes, he's made his million. And now he's off to a happy retirement. Eight to fast to catch jogs in the Jennings. A fourth consecutive Jennings victory. Eight to fast to catch. Thanks for the memories. Oh, Splash home, a convincing winner. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano. On this morning's show, a hard-to-believe decision. Racing's newest millionaire has retired, and we will welcome in a trio of special guests, beginning with Mr. Keith DeSormo, who will be sending out the maiden, Danette, in this afternoon's starlet at Los Alamitos. Then we'll be off to South Florida, to welcome our final two guests, Mr. Eddie Keneally, who's got Chivarelli for the Harlan's Holiday and a fascinating filly named Kitty Wine for the grassy South Beach. And finally, Mr. Marcus Vitale, who is represented in three stakes this afternoon at Gulfstream, highlighted by the ultra-consistent valid in the Harlan's Holiday. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our December 13th edition of the program. Good morning once again. Nice, bright, sunny December Saturday morning. Settle in, relax. I uh, think we've got a good show for you over the next 55 minutes. We're actually going to begin this morning with a kind of a head scratcher. Maybe more accurately, a head shaker. You know, one of those things which you know is so illogical even in this sport, you just can't believe that it's happening. I'm going to take you back to the September 27th Jockey Club Gold Cup. And this was the situation where Junior Alvarado uh, recklessly steered Moreno. He's in the white blinkers in the blue cap to the left of your screen into the path of Wicked Strong, cutting him off and dumping Rajiv Mara to the ground. Now, Mara was seriously injured with a broken arm. He missed sufficient time, couldn't ride in the Breeders' Cup, where one of his mounts, main sequence, won the turf. Alvarado, for his carelessness and recklessness, received a 15-day suspension from the stewards. Alvarado immediately appealed. Even though he was obviously guilty of reckless riding, he didn't want to miss any of the Belmont meet. He would take the days at a later time which happens throughout racing, but which is a ridiculous rule. Alvarado began taking his days on December 1st at a time when he was rehabbing from an accident which prevented him from riding. That's right. His penalty for dumping and injuring Rajiv Marat and injuring him, you know, seriously, was to take his days while he wasn't even riding. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, I've been in this game for a number of decades, and these rules, you know, so many people are worried about perception in this game. Uh, can, can you perceive this situation where someone who was obviously in the wrong and recklessly endangered another rider? That rider gets hurt, loses income, loses a winning Breeders' Cup mount, and the rider who did it, Junior Alvarado, is allowed to take days while he's rehabbing from an injury. He wasn't even riding at the time. In an unrelated event, jockeys Manny Franco and CeCe Lopez were both suspended 15 days 
for their part in a recent accident at Aqueduct, which injured Cornelio Velasquez and left two horses dead. Velasquez suffered a broken collarbone and will be out another three weeks to a month. Both Franco and Lopez have appealed and are riding at this time. When they want to take their days is unknown at this point. Keeneland has announced that they will move the 2015 Bluegrass Stakes up a week, giving horsemen four weeks from there to the Kentucky Derby. It will now be run on the same day as the Wood Memorial and the Santa Anita Derby and will have a purse of a million dollars. With Keeneland having gone back to a dirt surface, it is expected that the bluegrass, at least long term, will now have more of an impact on the Kentucky Derby. The Lexington Stakes, which was run two weeks in front of the Derby, will now take the former spot of the bluegrass. And Dan Loisel, the track announcer at Woodbine for about 45 or 46 years, will be retiring next May. Loisel, who called standard bread races, for the first 17 years of his career, has called Woodbine Thoroughbreds for the past 28 or 29 years. And Terry Finlay, who lost a very close contest against Rick Violet for president of the New York Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, will contest the results of that election. Finlay, who lost by a reported 14 votes, said that a number of members of NYTHA either received their ballots late or didn't get them at all. Finley, the head of West Point Stables, is calling for another election. How about some good news? The Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, which aids retired racehorses, announced yesterday that it will donate $2.4 million to its 42 accredited facilities for 2014 and that is absolutely wonderful news as the thoroughbred aftercare alliance gets more and more funds uh, they dole out that much more money and nearly two and a half million will go to their accredited facilities for this year terrific terrific news now speaking of retirement the hard-hitting maryland bred ate too fast to catch made his final career start in last Saturday's Jennings Handicap at Laurel. Eight too fast to catch, number two, inside in front. Making his 49th career start, eight too fast to catch, who had won three previous runnings of the Jennings, was looking to go over a million dollars, something which his late owner, Arnold Heft, would have been very proud of. After breaking a bit sluggishly, Forrest Boyce asked the eight-year-old for a little run to get early position, and eight too fast to catch responded nicely. After an opening quarter in a very manageable 24.06, it was pretty much a walk in the park. As eight too fast to catch repelled a bid from long shot Larry Lois and galloped away to a 10 and three quarter length romp in his career finale. His trainer, Tim Keefe, one of our guests last week, told us just how much this horse has meant to him and to his late owner and the fact that eight too fast to catch was able to go out a winner while capturing the Jennings for a record fourth time was a perfect ending to a wonderful career. It took eight too fast to catch, six races to break his maiden and another six to win his entry level allowance and he didn't win his first stakes until he was five years old. But in the end, he racked up a dozen stakes victories and more than a million dollars in earnings. Eight Too Fast to Catch is now off to Keefe's Farm to begin a second career as an event horse. And I wouldn't want to bet against him succeeding in that as well. Laurel will hold a retirement ceremony this afternoon for the wonderful gelding eight too fast to catch that is a terrific story and we are up to our first break when we return mr keith DeSormo will join us as we go to this break the garland of roses at aqueduct the dollar 25 to the dollar favorite number six willet 
making what I believe was her final career start. So we will take a look at the garland of roses to the break. Back with Keith DeSormo right after these messages. And they're off. Winning image from the inside post is out for the lead. Bridgehampton now moves up to challenge. So Bridgehampton pokes ahead in front of winning image, and those two have four and a half lengths on the Sounds of the City, who's on the outside in third. Will it towards the rail in fourth expression in between horses? Janata is the trailer. Entry mate, Bridgehampton, is up front and with the narrow lead over winning image. The quarter went in 22 and four fifth seconds. Bridgehampton gets clear of winning image. It's Bridgehampton in front by two, midway on the turn. Winning image is second by three. Willett is now being asked for run and is in third. Down on the inside is Janata, then Expression and Sounds of the City. They're at the top of the stretch, half mile in 46 and four fifth seconds. Here's Winning Image now to reclaim the lead. Willett on the outside. Janata is coming through down towards the rail and Expression on the outside. They move for the 16th pole. Winning Image. Expression and will it? Sounds of the City is fourth. Expression on the outside. Expression to win the Garland of Roses. Winning image was second. Then will it? And Sounds of the City. This is the OTB Television Network a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. I'm Anthony Mormino, and after more than 30 years, HNC is moving. HNC and all your favorite OTV TV programming is moving from Time Warner Cable 12 to Digital Channel 8.2. Along with WXXA, you'll also be able to watch us on Comcast Cable 323, Midtel Cable, 271, Mid-Hudson on 191, Verizon Fios 467, and Time Warner Cable on Channel 1250. For more information, log on to CapitalOTB.com. I got it. Watch me. I got it. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got a move that tells me what to do. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. An expression for Charlton Baker and Manny Franco riding on appeal. Rallies to run down a winning image and will it to capture the Garland of Roses. Our first guest this morning, I've been looking forward to getting him on the show. He upset the Breeders' Cup Juvenile with Texas Red. Later this afternoon, he's going to try to upset the Starlet at Los Alamitos with the Maiden Danette. We welcome live via telephone, Mr. Keith DeSormo. Keith Mark Cassano, welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Thank you. Maybe one of these days you'll be introducing me as a, a trainer who doesn't have to upset, but maybe I'll have a favorite one of these days. Well, uh, you know, whether it's a favorite or a good-priced horse, the only thing that matters is you win. You won the juvenile. We will talk about Texas Red a little bit later, let's begin with Danette. She is a stakes-placed maiden after six races. Keith, why continue to run her in stakes rather than go ahead and have her break her maiden against non-winners? Well, that, that's an easy answer, and it, and it involves zeros. Uh, the maiden race is about uh, fifty to 60000 and we're competing favorably in stakes anywhere from 250 today's 350 the breeders cup was two million that's an easy answer mark i could take her out of the stall and work her with with the best two-year-old in my barn and she'd outwork him and and obviously win the work by 10 lengths why would i so she knows how to win she knows what her job is why would i waste a top effort on a small purse 
It's a very simple answer. All right. Well explained. Now, you said she would outwork the best two-year-old in your barn. I assume the best two-year-old in your barn is Texas Red. Would she outwork well, him? That was a little uh, misspoken. The best maiden two-year-old. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Keith, take a moment. We're going to have a shot of Danette on the screen in a moment. Take a moment to describe her for our audience. What is she like physically, and what's she like mentally? How does she take to her training? Well, um, she's not really, uh, it's not hard to explain. She doesn't have any quirks, uh, no, no issues that we have to do any kind of special training or schooling. Uh, she's very, very well put together, confirmationally correct, good size, not huge, not small, right in the middle. And uh, she's still growing. And uh, being by Curlin and out of a Dixieland band there, you know the distance won't be an issue, and she'll only get better with time. And how about mentally? How is she to be around? How is she to work with? Oh, she's a sweetheart. Uh, uh, no, like I said, no issues. She's uh, kind in the barn as well as on the track. Well, we are about to take a look at a piece of her last race, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. As we pick it up for our audience, Danette number three, moving up strongly from the back of the pack along the fence. Keith, this was a very solid effort. Talk about it, if you would. Uh, uh, totally uh, uh, excited about that effort. And actually, uh, she was the one, uh, as far as gambling is concerned, that we were betting our money on. She, she was just coming up to the race in great shape. And uh, I think it was a, uh, you know, how can I be dissatisfied with the way that day went with the Texas Red winning? And uh, it's hard to be dissatisfied, but I honestly believe that we could have possibly won two of those. She, she had to use her energy, her, her fitness, whatever you, however you can explain it, to hold her position on the rail at the half mile pole, I think if that if we could have just let the race come back to us and uh, make a smooth move, whether it be on the rail, coming outside, doesn't matter. Uh, but if we could have let that speed come back to us, I think we would have had a different outcome. Uh, even with that being said, um, when she did get through on the rail and was making a move for the lead. She was blocked all the way through the stretch. So, um, yes, we're excited about it and looking forward to today. You know, although she finished a close fifth there, which followed a third in the chandelier, she appears to be improving with each start. Would that be accurate to say? Uh, whether I think so or not, uh, I, I agree. But the numbers say she is, too. Every buyer speed figure has improved since her first start. That's uh, five uh, consecutive weight races, so yes. And I do believe through her training that she will improve another notch today. Um, and, you know, we're, we're running against horses that have really been uh, put through uh, their trials. They, they, one of the favorites has run, well, it went down the Delta Downs, over to Churchill Downs, and now she's coming back to California to try to beat us again. Uh, I would think that we have an advantage uh, rested and uh, we're running in our backyard. She's run four times on synthetic and her two most recent starts on dirt. Is dirt her best surface? No doubt. And the, again, we talk about numbers. Curlins are pathetic on the, on the synthetic track. I mean, he showed that when uh, he went fourth in the British Cup. Yeah, yeah. Classic. Uh, Might have been a different outcome on a, on a dirt surface. But it, that, it also is explained in his numbers. Most of his offspring are not productive on synthetic tracks. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that anymore. How did uh, Danette come out of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies? Excellent. Um, I explained before that I think she had a pretty rough trip, took a lot of dirt, uh, made a strong move to the half-mile pole, got bumped around, turned it for home but you could not tell by the way she recovered. She, uh, she's cleaned up 
her feed, her legs are nice and tight. She put her weight back on a couple of days after the race, so she's uh, she's doing well. No complaints. Was today's starlet always in your plans, or did you wait until after the Breeders' Cup to see how she was doing? Oh no, we gave it two weeks. Two weeks of uh, watching her recover, uh, enjoying the the position that we were in, and then we went to work uh, looking at races across the country. Were we going to do the same as with Texas Red and give her a break? She earned it. Um, but uh, this race came up. Again, it's in our backyard, and it just seems like a no-brainer. How's she training coming into this afternoon, Starlet? Excellent. We had a nice uh, series of works, a um, couple of halves, a couple of five-eighths, finish strong just like you like them, cooling out nice cleaning up her feet, all those basics that you like to see uh, in training, she's doing, so no complaints. Well, let's go back to Breeders' Cup Saturday and take a look at the juvenile. As we pick it up, Texas Red last at the bottom of the screen. Keith, talk about this runaway victory. Well, I think a lot, th there's no doubt the horse is hugely talented. We've always known that. Uh, but a part of what made him look so great, I think, is that that, that uh, the uh, fractions in the race were so quick yeah. that they, had, they just had to come back. And the whole field seemed to be chasing those fractions. It is my brother, that I, I, that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he let speed go. He had his horse in total cruise control he had confidence in his hands the horse had confidence in him and when he asked him to go that's the way he's trained that's the way he's uh raced since the onset of his career and it was just uh it was like practice for him so it, it uh, the horse yes is obviously hugely talented but it also set up very nice for him with the whole field chasing crazy speed Keith, had he given you any indication coming into this race that this type of performance was in the works? Well, Mark, if you look at his form, he, he's jumping 10 to 15 to 20 buyer speed figures every race. Now, that you can see on paper. Physically, he's probably 16, 3, or 4 at this point. Big horse, growing, uh, blooming as we speak. So yes, uh, physically you could see that he was changing. The pedigree says that the more distance, the better. And those numbers jumping by 10 and 15 points every race, the, you don't need to hear it from me. It was, it was staring right at you. And how exciting was it to win your first Breeders' Cup race and win it in that fashion? Come on, man. You're talking about an old country boy from Louisiana <laughs> that, that, you know, we just love the game and uh, have to be involved. Of course, yes, we're always pushing for higher standards and better horses. Uh, but there's a difference between trying and, and actually accomplishing your goals. So to come from where we uh, do, uh, to do it with a basically a very uh, inexpensive horse, it shows, it, it, what's exciting to me is that it shows, th this is why you have people from all walks of life involved in the game. Because yeah. a good horse can come from anywhere. And, and that's what we've been trying to prove over the years, and we finally did it. What did your brother Kent say after the race? Oh, well, you know, he, Kent's always been so dang high strung. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he, you know, Kent's been there. Kent's been to the top and back and back again uh, over the last 20 years. So he's been there. So to see his brother who, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I've struggled. I've had a good life. But to see the, the hard work, the labor that we put in over the last 20 years, uh, to see me reach that pinnacle, I think, was very exciting for him. Well, that's, that's wonderfully said. Keith, uh, earlier you described him for us as, as a big colt, about 16-3. What's he like mentally? What's he like to work with? How's he take to his training? 
very intelligent horse, um, and you can see it in his eyes. He's uh, wide between his eyes, a very deep look, uh, handsome, very handsome, but very, very intelligent looking. Uh, again, as with the net, very easy to be around. Of course, he is a colt, so he's a little bit more rambunctious in the stall, and, uh, you know, he'll react to uh, things um uh, in an excitable manner, a little easier than she will, but it's all in good nature, and it's because he's feeling good. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body, and uh, not much else to say. Very easy to be around if you know what you're doing around a horse. Uh, you wouldn't want to come in there with uh, just someone off the street and try to pet him. He'll take their arm off. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> What's he been doing since the Breeders' Cup? Training lightly, uh, enjoying the San Gabriel Mountains and the weather. Although the weather the last couple of days hasn't been uh, been far from perfect, but uh, jogging, light galloping, uh, just taking it easy. And uh, we're going to pick up the work schedule starting next week. All right, let's talk about 2015, early 2015 for a moment. Do you have a spot? picked out for his three-year-old debut i wish i could give you a definitive plan it's still in the works i'm leaning towards the uh san vicente which is a seven eight uh seven eight uh stake on uh, february 1st it just seems like a good place to uh crank him up fire him up put some speed into him for uh for uh the route races down the line as far as after that race, I don't know if we'll stick around in Santa Anita, travel to get him acclimated to traveling. Seems like a good idea. Different surfaces. Uh, with But with all that being said, how can you deny the success of horses that come directly out of California without traveling at all? Pioneer of the Nile, California Chrome, Silver Charm. All those horses train right there at Santa Anita and never leave. And how about Giacomo? Um, and those are just coming off the top of my head. I'm sure there's more. Uh, but there's just undeniable success by horses that just train and run in a series of three-year-old races at Santa Anita. So I'm telling myself, why, why complicate it? Why don't you just do that? So uh, that's what's going through my mind right now. Should we stick to that series and stay in California, or should we acclimate him to traveling? Uh, because we, we, we like to think that we'll be doing plenty of traveling coming uh, come uh, Kentucky Derby time. That's right. It is fascinating, Keith, that you've talked about starting him back as a three-year-old in a 7 eighths race. Let's face it, he's already won at eight and a half furlongs, but a lot of old-time trainers, and you're not an old-timer, but a lot of old-time trainers like to start their three-year-olds back sprinting. I think that's a fascinating decision. Yeah, well, it, uh, it, it, it seems <laughs> to make sense. I don't know if it's because of old-time training or just in the back of my mind. I've, I've seen it happen before. I know that I'm bridled, prepped in the Hutchinson yep. at... at uh, at uh, Gulfstream and actually beat House Buster, showed how awesome of a horse he was. Uh, but it's also, I'm not going into the race. Uh, I, I honestly would be going into the race as a means to an end uh, to create something for down the line. It's not all about winning every dang time you enter. Uh, although I, we're always trying to win, win, but I'm just saying that that race would be a means to an end. Not not all out to uh, uh, win at seven eight. It's a it's a uh, a way to start way to start the campaign. You will be involved in Louisiana a Champions Day today at the fairgrounds. You've got Tensas Harbor for the ladies. Tell us about her. Hey, how about Tensas Harbor? Eleven thousand dollar yearling. Bought at a sale in Texas. Louisiana bred. She's made 360, I think, now, and uh, she's at the top of her career. She's uh, training great. We're coming into this race the same way as we did last year. 
uh, off of a stake at Delta, and uh, we expect her to run as good a race as last year, and that was her career best effort. So we're excited about today. And finally, you've got the recent maiden winner, Royal Rising, in the juvenile, going for another upset in the juvenile. Yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> maiden, uh, a lot of, not a whole hell of a lot of uh, opportunity uh, as two-year-olds. He, he needs a distance, and again, a means to an end. I do think this horse has the talent to beat that field, but it's also a great way to prep him for his future uh, route racing career. Well, Keith, first of all, all congratulations on all the successes, the great win with Texas Red in the Juvenile. All the best later this afternoon with Danette and your starters in Louisiana Champions Day. And thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Oh, thank you. It was fun. We'll look forward to uh, speaking with you again early next year. Yes, sir. Keith DeSormo, ladies and gentlemen, the trainer of juvenile winner Texas Red and Danette. And we are up to our next break. When we return, it's off to South Florida, where we'll welcome Mr. Eddie Keneally. As we go to this break, the Bayacoa at Los Alamitos. And the Fortify favorite, number three, Tis Midnight. So we'll take a look at the Bayacoa to the break. Back with Eddie Keneally right after these messages. And they're off in the Bayacoa. Valiant Amelia has hustled out for the early lead. Yahilwa came away in good order, and Tiz Midnight in between them. Legacy is wrangled back now to take the third position. They're followed by Oscar Party and Warren's Vanitas at the back. Into the first turn they go, and it's Yahilwa setting the tempo, leads by a length. Tiz Midnight, perfect trip second. Three more to Legacy in third. At the rail, Oscar Party a joint fourth with Valiant Amelia just outside of her. And Warren's Vanita on hold at the back. Six lengths covers the field. Five and a half furlongs to go. It's Yahilwa in front, three quarters of a length to Tiz Midnight second. Legacy an eager third between horses. Oscar Party hugs the rail and now moves up to claim third. Outside of them, Valiant Amelia only three and a half off the lead. Warren's Vanita moves up willingly and trying to find room in between rivals. Tightly grouped a half mile from home in the Bayacoa. Yahilwa's been there throughout. Tis midnight, yet to be asked for her best. Now comes to challenge, heading to the three furlong point. A length and a half back to Legacy in third. Warren's Vanita needs to find some racing room. She's running on willingly. Oscar Party inside of her. Valiant Amelia could not keep up. Tis midnight, the new leader at the top of the stretch. Legacy closing gamely on the outside. Yahilwa, Oscar Party behind them, and then Warren's Vanita. They're heading to the furlong pole. It's Tiz Midnight. Warren's Vanita appears the only threat. She's running on strongly. Warren's Vanita coming after Tiz Midnight, coming to the furlong pole. Tiz Midnight all out. Warren's Vanita up alongside. Warren's Vanita puts her head in front. Tiz Midnight is tough and battling back. It's a photo finish. Here it is. Close. Tiz Midnight and Warren's Vanita. Legacy finish third, then Valiant Amelia. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTB.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTB.com. Log on today. Funding your Capital OTB bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks once again to Keith DeSormo and Tis Midnight, Bob Baffert, Victor Espinosa. Gamely comes back to uh, win by a head over Warren's Veneta to capture the Bayacoa. Our next guest, well, he'll be represented in a couple of stakes this afternoon at Gulfstream Park with Chivarelli 
in the Harlands Holiday with Kitty Wine in the grassy South Beach. We welcome in live via telephone from South Florida, Mr. Eddie Keneally. Eddie Marcusano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, guys. Nice to have you as always. Eddie, let's begin with Chivarelli. We had you on the program Wood Memorial morning to discuss him. Later that day, he went out and, and ran what I thought was a very creditable fourth. But we didn't see him for another six months. What happened to Chivarelli after the wood? He ran really well that day, and he was just uh, on, on, a, on a good cycle. He was doing really well. But he came out of it with a slight bone chip uh, in, a, in a knee, and we took it out surgically removed a, a very minor chip, but it was enough there that it was irritating him. Uh, we felt like the best thing to do was to take it out, but we've had no issues with that knee since, and he's been real good. Eddie, in a moment, we're going to have a shot of him on the screen. Would you take a moment to describe Chivarelli for our audience? What's he like physically, and how is he mentally? How does he take to his training and day-to-day -day activities? He's a class act. Um, he's a very laid-back horse, no issues with him whatsoever. He's a very kind horse to be around. Um, big, pretty horse. Um, he's not a heavy horse by any means, but he carries decent weight. And um, he's just a three-year-old. I think he's still developing. I think he could even be a, a bigger, stronger version next year. But uh, he's a very well-proportioned, well-balanced horse. He returned from that uh, six-plus month layoff after the Wood to win an allowance sprint at Keeneland. Then in his last start, the Millions Classic Preview. And as we pick it up for our audience, he's number three, third on the far outside. Eddie, he finished, I guess what I would classify, an okay third. Talk about this effort. You know what, the two that finished in front of him are accomplished horses, very accomplished horses, both uh, graded stakes winners, and um, their home base is called a racetrack. Yeah. We ran our horse called her shipping him in, and I think we were at a disadvantage. Our horse didn't care for the surface. It's a very good surface at, at, at Calder, but some horses dislike it. Our horse wasn't in love with it. I think the two that finished in front of him uh, took to the track a lot better than we did. Our horse kind of floundered on the track but still ran brave to be beaten two lengths over a track that uh, it was obvious from watching the race and talking to the rider uh, that he, he wasn't his favorite surface. Eddie, how did he come out of the race? Came out real good. Came out real good. Had a few nice work since then, and um, he's training training really, really well. So he's had no issues this, uh, this while, this last while. He's been very, very good. Is today's Harlan's holiday... I mean, obviously, you want to win this this afternoon, but, but is this a stepping tone to the Sunshine Millions Classic or something else down the line at Gulfstream? We want to run him on the track and see how he likes it. Uh, I think that's the number one thing. Uh, he's never run at Gulfstream, and uh, there's a lot of opportunities at Gulfstream for him if he likes the track. Uh, so we're just going to watch him today and make a decision then after this about where he should go next. In today's grassy South Beach, you run Kitty Wine. Now, Eddie, she was away from the races from August of 2012 to January of this year. Why the extended layoff? She had a few different issues. She had a breeding issue, and um, she's just uh, going through a bad, bad uh, run there at that time. So we opted to give her some time out. Nothing major, but she's come back real well. She's a daughter of Lemon Drop Kid, and you don't often think of Lemon Drop Kids having a lot of early natural speed, but it appears she's got plenty of early speed, whether it's in a sprint on the main track or a turf race. Yeah, she has natural speed. I don't know where that's coming from. It might be coming from the female side of her family, um, but she's got natural speed, and um, She's, she, we're looking for some black type for this filly. She doesn't have any. She's uh, a filly with a nice page, but we want to try to add to add to that. And um, this race suits her. The distance, I think, suits her perfectly. Yeah. Well, we are about to take a look at her last start in a Keeneland allowance for our audience. Kitty Wine, number 11, breaking from the extreme outside post. 
Eddie, despite the layoff, and often when horses who have early speed are so fresh, it's difficult to rate them, but I thought she rated very kindly in here. Yeah, she had a nice post, so she, she was outside of horses throughout, and that helped her relax. And um, sometimes when she gets in behind horses, she doesn't relax quite as well. But uh, she relaxed fine that day and, um, and got it done off a layoff, uh, five- or six-month layoff, uh, to win that allowance race. And we've kind of freshened her since then with this race in mind because she's a filly that runs well fresh. So even though she hasn't run since Keeneland, um, I think she'll be all right. It's just a question of is she good enough for some of these horses. Some of these horses are stake winners. She's not a stake winner as yet. So it's a, it's a much deeper spot for her today, but uh, I, I think she'll run real well. The race we're watching, she was coming off a five-month layoff. Eddie, did you think she was ready to win off the layoff, or did you think she might need one? Well, I knew she's run well in, when she's fresh in the past, so I thought she'd run well in that race, yeah. I was expecting a good effort. What did Julian, you rode Julian Leperu this day, and he will ride her later this afternoon. What do you have to say to you after the race? He was surprised, like you were, how, how well she relaxed that day off the break, off the layoff. Uh, typically, horses like that are, are a little bit free and keen in their races uh, when they haven't run for a while. But uh, she relaxed just fine, and that's what impressed him the most, and that enabled her to finish so well. Now, big field today, Eddie, in the South Beach, and you draw post position number three, obviously inside of most of the field. What will your instructions be to Julian? You, you mentioned earlier you might rather have her outside of horses. Yeah, I'm just going to have to leave it up to him, and depending on the break, how well she breaks and how well everyone else is breaks, how, how well everyone else breaks, and who wants to lead and if anybody wants to lead. Just he, He's going to have to play that one by ear. I can't really tell him what to do because no one ever knows how a race with uh, 13 runners is going to unfold. So I'm just going to let him ride her with some confidence, and um, wherever she's placed in the running of the race is fine as long as she's relaxed. Just a couple of other things quickly before we let you go. Tomorrow here in New York in the East View, you run Freudy Ann. Tell us about her. Freudy Ann is two for three. Um, she just won a mile allowance it's on the main track in Aqueduct in her most recent race. She's doing well. She's in a New York restricted race tomorrow going around the ground. Um, she's never run on the inner track. This is a whole lot different track than the main track at Aqueduct. So we don't know how she's going to handle the track. Uh, some horses love it, some not so much. If she takes the liking to the track, she'll get it done. She's doing great. And finally... When you run a maiden for the second time, that's a very strong angle for the Keneally Barn. On Tuesday at Gulfstream, you've got a second-time starter by the name of Ready Get Set in what looks to be potentially a very strong maiden race. Tell us a little bit about Ready Get Set. Nice horse. Um, ran first out at Churchill a month ago. Uh, didn't get beaten very far, um, might have got a little tired, made a big run on the turn and then emptied out in the stretch. Uh, got, like I said, maybe got a little tired in his first out. He's had a couple of nights work since he ran and um, shipped down to Florida without any problem. So he's making his second start on Tuesday, and um, I like him. I like him. There's a couple of first-time starters in there you don't know what they are. It might be the next coming in there. You never know. With, uh, there's a couple of barns there uh, that have quality horses in their stable, so you never know if one of them is the real deal or not. But if the first-timers in this race aren't spectacular, our horse should get it done. And you've uh, convinced Mr. Castellano and his agent to ride him on Tuesday. Yeah, Javier is, is the leading rider in the nation, uh, and we've had success with him. So whenever we can get him, we're... We're glad to have him. Well, Eddie, as always, thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. And all the best later this afternoon with Chivarelli and Kitty Wine. And we'll look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eddie. Eddie Keneally, ladies and gentlemen. And we are up to our final break. When we return, 
back to Florida where we'll welcome Mr. Marcus Vitelli as we go to the break, the Aventura last Sunday at Gulfstream. Two to five favorite, number five, a treaties. So we will take a look at the Aventura to the break. Back with Marcus Vitelli right after these messages. Complete the line. Going in. They are all in line. They're racing in the Aventura Handicap, and Atreides got bounced around at the break there. Atreides, off to a poor beginning, got boxed in right from the start. And it's Dude Man going out for the lead. Tony B. Atreides is forced to go to the far outside early, and Shiva Curlin comes to an opening on the inside as Dude Man will lead them out of the chute. Dude Man is the leader. Tony B. running along in second. Atreides is third to the outside. And then it's Shiva Curlin, followed by Urban Cool. A length and a half farther back to General Shama. Quiet Ruler is next. And best plan yet. They went 24 and 2 for the opening quarter mile. Up the back stretch, Dude Man up top. Three quarters of a length. Tony B. is second. Heavily favored Atreides is third to the outside. He did not have a good beginning, but he's in contention. Shiva Curlin is fourth after a half mile as they enter the far turn that goes in 47 and 4 fifth seconds. So they move into the turn with Dude Man in front, and now Atreides moves three wide. Tony B is in between those two. And then it's Urban Cool in fourth, two lengths off the lead. Shiva Curlin is next on the inside, and then comes Best Plan Yet. Around the far turn, Dude Man and Atreides. And these two are together coming to the top of the stretch. It is Dude Man in front. Atreides is right alongside as they turn for home. And now Edgar Zayas asks him to roll. And he's head and head with Dude Man. And Atreides now takes over the lead at the eighth pole. Atreides in front. And he's pulling away willingly now. Leaving Dude Man and the others behind. Urban Cool is third as Atreides comes home strong. He won it by five in the end. It's tight for a second between Dude Man and Urban Cool. Best plan yet was fourth. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Hey, race fans. Head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. We're moving. That's right, OTB TV is moving. Beginning January 1st, we'll be broadcasting in a full digital signal. All your favorite tracks now with a clearer picture and better sound. For more information, log on to CapitalOTB.com and we'll see you there. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks once again to Eddie Keneally for having joined us in a treaties. Marty Wolfson being quite conservative with him, Edgard Zayas by four and a half, over Dudeman and Urban Cool to win the Aventura. He is certainly going to face substantially better in his next start, you know, which could come in something like the Hal's Hope, something like that. But, uh, you know, this has been a pretty hyped horse, and he has buried everything he's faced in South Florida. But the one time he left South Florida for a stakes, he did not run well at all. We are currently waiting for Marcus Vitali. He mentioned to us he just needed a couple of minutes. So let me mention to you a couple of things here. The New York Racing Association has announced that it will run 251 cards of racing, at, at least scheduled cards, next year. But only 13 of those cards will be run during the month of March. Naira looking to cut back on racing at a time of year where you know, they and everybody else, or most, most everybody else, has problems with field size. So 251 days of racing next year. Saratoga, July 24th through September 7th, the latest start possible for Saratoga. All right, our final guest. We'll have three starters this afternoon at uh, Gulfstream in the Stakes, highlighted by Valid in the Harlan's Holiday. We welcome to Down the Stretch, Mr. Marcus Vitelli. Marcus, Mark Cassano, welcoming you to Down the Stretch. 
My, my pleasure, and uh, glad to be on the air with you. Well, it's nice to have you. Now, Marcus, as a first-time guest to the program, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Oh, I don't know what to say. I train horses here in South Florida. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. I came up at uh, Narragansett Racetrack, Lincoln Downs, Rockingham Park days, Brockton, Boshville, Montana, Great Barrington. I've done it all from uh, Kyle Walker, Pony Boy, Bad Jockey, to horse trainer, an assistant <laughs> trainer for a lot of years, um, to an old trainer named Eddie Vashi. Um, and uh, he passed away some years ago, and I kind of had a couple with him, and then I, you know, sprouted off on my own. Marcus, let's and, talk about... And, uh, Let's talk about the very consistent Valid in his last 12 starts since you got him. Dating back 13 months, only one time has he been out of the top three. What makes him so consistent? Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a special horse. I, I, I picked up a, uh, actually, uh, Miss Vogel, um, Cross Sabres. We, we uh, went to the sales and... Um, he had those horses picked out, uh, Lossy Valley, and there was a few others that, of course, we that went out of our, uh, so to speak, budget that for that sale. Um, and uh, you know, it just turned out we got him back here to South Florida after the sale, and we got going on him, and you know, they just started going in the, in the right direction. They came out of a great camp. Those people do a, a wonderful, wonderful job, um, and. Uh, you know, sometimes they don't get going quick enough for certain people, and they don't fit their fit their style. I just I, I, I don't have any rhyme or reason for what happened. Um, you know, I just got lucky, so to speak. In this game, you need a lot of luck, and I I feel uh, invalid. And some of the other horses in the barn, uh, we were fortunate to be able to purchase. Marcus, in a moment, we're going to have a shot of Valid on the screen. Would you take a moment to describe him for our audience? What's he like physically and mentally? What's he like to be around? Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a good horse, good feeling horse. He's a big, big horse. Um, he's uh, uh, definitely a nice ride. Uh, the girl that gets on him has been getting on him since day one. Um, unless she's out of town. She's also my assistant out of town, you know, with other horses. I mean, they just, he's good around the barn. Um, he's, you know, he's one of the uh, the favorites in the barn, which they're all my favorites. But, you know, the girls pick favorite ones out. I, I, I think they're all special. But um, he's good to be around. He's, I can't say enough about him. There's, you know, how could I describe him? He's a big, he's a big, good-looking animal. He's good to be around. He, he's all business, and he knows what he's here for. Marcus, in looking at his past performances, and he started 20 times now, fair to say that he's at his very best somewhere between seven eighths and eight and a half furlongs? You know, I like him anywhere from seven eighths to a mile and a sixteenth. I think I, I think I pushed the pencil a little bit over the mile and a sixteenth mark. Um, you know, he did have a couple races that were pretty decent going a mile and an eighth. Uh, going back to the Penn National race, that was a that was an awesome. That was an awesome race. Uh, I thought I won the race that day, and uh, evidently the photo showed different. And uh, that was a mile and an eighth, I believe. Um, he 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 suited best. I would have to agree with you. Um, up to a mile and a sixteenth. Well, we are about to take a look at his last race, the October eleventh, eight miles west at the former Calder. For our audience, Valid is number one in here. Marcus, talk about this effort, if you would. Uh, that was a great race. Uh, my horses both finished um, really well in there. Um, Midnight Cello, his stable mate, ran second in that race. Um, I'm on the phone right now, so I can't see exactly where, what, what point of the race it is right now. Just going around the first turn. Yeah. Um, I think at that point, um, he might have already been on the lead um, into the first turn, if, I, if, my, if I'm right. Uh, is, that the, is that the case here? Well, right now, they're straightening out down the backstretch, and he's third on the fence 
in behind the two leaders. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so it shouldn't be long before he, uh, Bopatika, um, sends him through there. Um, like I said, I'm not watching. I'm not watching the race. I remember it, but you know, I watch so many races every day. It's kind of, you know, unless I put it on, I kind of get lost in the in the shuffle sometimes. Um, but I, I know down the stretch, my other horse come from out of it, uh, uh, Midnight Cello, and they they uh, this horse just never let him never let him go by, and uh, he finished he finished strong. So. Well, well, he is going to run down his stable, my Midnight Cello, and that, and that brings me to a question about Midnight Cello because he, in looking at his past performances, he appears to be better on dirt, but you're running him on grass today. Why? Oh, <laughs> well, his numbers are his numbers are better on on dirt. We we see that those you know mostly you know the old saying goes the numbers don't lie. I'm going to beg to differ with it a little bit at the distance today, seven and a half. Um, he's going seven and a half today. You got two scratches in the race. You got the fours out and the fives out. So it moves it moves him up to the six hole, I believe. Uh, I, I think it worked out well for Midnight Cello. Yeah, he, he can't. The horse can grab. There's no there's no doubt about it. Um, I think he's going to surprise a lot of people today. Um, he's he's doing good. He's training good. Like it, like. There's no, they're good horses. I mean, good horses overcome. Um, he's going to have to overcome a few things today, but I think he's up for the up for the challenge, and we're going to we're going to hope for the best. Now back to Valid. How did he come out of his last race? How's he been training up to this afternoon's Harlan's Holiday? He's been training like a monster. I've been trying to run this horse even before the. I wanted to run him once more in between. You know, uh, I like the race horses. You know, they're in the bond the race. If they're healthy and they're eating good and they're doing good and something comes up, I'm usually ready for it. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have anything in between. Um, so we had a kind of coast in the Holland holiday here. I, I think he's in, coming into the race with a couple sharp breezes. Um, great attitude. He's doing everything great. I'm looking at him now as we talk. Um, he's perked forward. He's looking outside at the grassy area. Um, he's up front. He's paying attention. He's, he's doing everything right going into this race. Well, Marcus, that sounds wonderful. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best later this afternoon with Valid, Midnight Cello, and Triple Arch, a long shot in the South Beach. We wish you all the best. All right. I appreciate being on the air, and any time, uh, don't hesitate to invite me. Thank you, Marcus. Marcus Vitale, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Let's uh, wrap things up by, uh, well, before we wrap things up, let's give you a reminder about channel changes coming January 1st of next year. You know, I think most of our audience watches us on Time Warner Cable. Well, we're going to be moving from the current channel 12 on Time Warner to 1250. That's not bad at all. The digital signal, WXXA, channel 8.2, will be your digital signal. And we will also be seen on Verizon Fios at 467, Mid-Hudson Cable 191, Comcast 323, and Mid-Tel Cable at channel 271. All of those changes, and those are obviously important changes, coming on New Year's Day 2015. All right, time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air here in the studios at the Clubhouse Racebook in Albany. Our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, Dino Contenacci, and Mick Richards. Back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta directed, Dan Hayes on audio. And thanks to this morning's guests, Marcus Vitale, Keith DeSormo, and Eddie Keneally. And as always, thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the racing action from coast to coast right here at Capitol. Have a wonderful upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week.
You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting. Thank you.